Joining us in the studio today to talk about the Republican Party's campaign in Israel is Mark Zell, co-chair for the Israeli branch of Republicans overseas. Thanks so much for coming in. Great to be here, Natasha. So, to begin, you know, this is, we were talked about this before, but this is one of the first times that we're seeing the Republican Party launch a campaign here in Israel. Can you tell us about that and why that's happening right now? Well, first of all, make you, let me make you this clear. This is the Republicans overseas in Israel launching this campaign. Right. We are... We are financing it, we are organizing it, we're coordinating it, of course, with the Trump campaign and the Republican National Committee. But this is our initiative. This is a way to get the 300 or 400,000 Americans who are eligible to vote out to the, uh, get their absentee ballots going and, 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 and participate in a process that will have long-term effects on the relationship between the United States and Israel. Absolutely. So I want to talk to you first about a, Har a Haaretz article that I read about you previously, mm -hmm. where you quoted that you might even resign if Donald Trump was elected, but now obviously that's changed. Why, why has that changed? I said what I said, and I said it because uh, I supported Marco Rubio during the, the primary elections, and I actually, after it became clear that Donald Trump was going to be our nominee, I offered to resign, and uh, my board rejected it, and the international board also rejected it, and they said, take a second look before you do anything rash, so, which I did. I looked into it. First of all, I had to say, listen, Something I didn't expect when I made those comments to Aritz is that the the electorate, the voters, would decide to uh, support Donald Trump in such huge numbers. I mean, they, he took 37 states and he got 14 million votes, which was historic in, 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 in U.S. primary election history. The other thing, of course, is I began to meet his people. I met his advisors on Israel. I met uh, uh, his members of his family. I met uh, the... The advisors of who became the, the vice presidential nominee, Mike Pence from Indiana, and I was—I had a—I realized that there was a different story here. There was a Donald Trump, his public persona, which we all know about. You know, this is a lot of bombast, and and maybe somebody would even say demagoguery. But behind the scenes, as a successful businessman who's had a, a built in a, a very serious international business empire. You don't do that by acting like a reality show candidate, okay? So he, there are two sides to him. And this was confirmed to me by a United States senator, I don't need to mention his name, who told me in Cleveland, for example, that he had met with Trump on a couple of occasions. And he had also supported Rubio in the primaries. And when he met with Trump, he was surprised. One of the things he found that in a private meeting, outside of the public uh, limelight, he was attentive, he had done his homework, he asked questions, and most important, he listened. It wasn't like he knew everything. And he said, the senator said when, when, he, when he saw this, and uh, he was extremely impressed and said, this, is, this guy has the temperament and the character to be president of the United States. Now he's going about it in an unorthodox way. This is a very unorthodox election. He's shaking up a lot of you know, traditional views. So speaking of that, you know, and also talking about his history as a businessman, one of the major things that we're seeing in the news this week is the fact that Trump has failed to show his tax forms to the world, unlike other candidates in the past. What is your response to that to people who say, well, is, is it true that he has uh, the fortune that he claims that he has? <laughs> well, I mean, if, you know, this, this is a kind of issue, Natasha, that that the press and the Democrats have been focusing on. Instead of dealing with anything of substance, they're dealing with this kind of silly question. All right, he's addressed this consistently through the primaries, and I'm not even going to uh, deal with it here. I mean, his he, he, he has filled out and supplied to the federal government detailed financial disclosure far more elaborate than anything he would report on his tax returns to the United States. That's all available. The public has it. This is, this is just a red herring. Uh, that's an expression in English. So I, I, let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about who he's running against. I mean, that's what, the, that's what all of this is, all these questions of this sort are designed to, to deflect the debate from who he's running against to these kind of ancillary issues. You got Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine. Who are these people? Well, this Hillary Clinton is, is, is a piece of work. I mean, she was Secretary of State for four or five years, whatever it was, and she presided over the most disastrous period in the U.S. foreign policy that I can remember. I mean, one failure after the next, whether you talk about 
the, Iran, uh, the, Re the Arab Spring, the fall of Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Syria, the, the, the implosion of Syria, the, uh, the, the, the Russian reset, which was a disaster, Crimea, Ukraine, China, and the big daddy of them all was the Iran-U.S. agreement on nuclear uh, on the nuclear uh, uh, program. So, which which you've got here, I mean, and and I and that's just a partial list. I mean, the Democrats like to say, well, we need somebody with a lot of experience. Well, she has a lot of experience, but she has no common sense. She has no judgment. That's the first piece. The second piece is she's a pathological liar. I mean, she does. It's amazing. I mean, she she'll even lie about her name, okay, and her her origin and her military service and and what happened to her when she was in Bosnia at the airport in 1996. Those are silly things, but she lies about the big things too. She lied about Benghazi to the face of the victims' uh, uh, parents and families, and she's lying now daily about this whole situation with these emails that one every day something new comes out just this week uh, a judicial watch uh, uh, discovery of, of emails proved that while she was secretary of state she was doing uh, influence peddling for the for the clinton foundation which collected hundreds of millions of dollars i think a couple billion dollars over the time of uh, since since uh, bill clinton left the, and hillary left the white house in two thousand and one i mean it's in enormous sums of money. She claimed to have left the, the White House broke. And, she, and her tax returns, which she, she did disclose, showed that she's earned $240 million, she and her husband. I mean, one lie after the next. And the last thing, Natasha, the last thing is the corruption. I mean, this is, a, this is an influence peddling juggernaut, the Clinton, the Clinton family. And, and the idea that, they, that, I mean, they've actually sold out the national interest. They were talking about the uranium deposits. They, 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 they arranged to have the, turned over into the hands of a Russian company. I mean, one thing after the next. There's no, there's so no let's, shame let's here. And, and, you're, and we're talking here. about putting her back in the White House. I mean, Donald Trump is an angel compared to that lady, this lady. So <laughs> let's, let's turn our focus to Israel a little bit more specifically. Sure. What would a Trump presidency look like for Israel? Well, first of all, I think it's going to be one, a presidency that has Israel's back. I've said, I've said that the main reason that I became uh, uh, and agreed to become a Trump supporter is that I got the clear and un, unequivocal message from the campaign, I've seen it, in, in terms of deeds and actions uh, since, he's, uh, be, uh, since I've become to support him, that he is solidly behind Israel. I mean, he is, he is talking about defanging the Iran nuclear agreement, you know, as soon as he gets into office. He's talking about, he made a statement, which is an incredible statement, that Israelis have the right to build anywhere they choose in the land of Israel. That's, 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 the, that's, a, that's an extraordinary statement for a candidate. He's, you know, during, during the, uh, the terror attacks, when the Obama White House would ignore the, the victims here in Israel, he was quick on his tweet, uh, Twitter program and in public to condemn the violence of Israeli victims, just, just as uh, he was quick to condemn the, the, the horrible uh, tragedy that occurs in, in France and in Belgium and Orlando and San Bernardino. This is a guy that has Israel's back. He's not throwing us under the bus. And in the case of the Democrats, you've got eight years to prove it. Now, Hillary Clinton, she could have said, you know, I, I don't agree with Obama about what, what he's done in Israel. But this is the lady that picked up the phone, not once, twice, maybe three times. Every time they, they decided to, to approve a building plan in Jerusalem for Jewish residents to, to, to close in a balcony or build a new house apartment com uh, complex, she gets on the phone and berates our prime minister for 45 minutes. I mean, she's got more important things to do than you would think than to worry about, you know, a, a, an apartment complex in Jerusalem. I mean, she's got the Russians, she's got the Chinese, she's got the North Koreans, for God's sake. The Middle East is going up in flames, and she's berating Bibi Netanyahu about apartments in Jerusalem, and, and, and on and on and on. This is so not what, this is, this, is, this is what we're voting about in this election. So my final question for you is sure. how do you think that this campaign, the Republican Party, that Republican Overseas, can, uh, that's the name of the party, Republican Overseas? Republicans Overseas Israel. Israel. There we go. Republican right. Overseas Israel will affect the outcome of the election. 
elections? Are we going to see people actually voting in favor of Donald Trump as a result of this campaign? Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, and I believe, I mean, every, everybody, I walk around here uh, every day wearing this Trump button. And the, the, the amazing thing is how many people come up to me, both Americans and non-Americans, and say, right on, okay. Yeah, we, 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 we could very well have a significant effect. And by the way, in, two, in the year 2000, right, there was an election between Bush and Gore. And the election came down to the state of Florida. And in the state of Florida, it came down a few counties in southern Florida. And the difference between the two candidates that determined the presidents of the United States was 537 votes. You know, many, you, many, you know how many votes came from Israel during that election for George Bush? 1,500. If they hadn't voted, Al Gore would have been the president of the United States. So, yes, these, the votes here can have a significant impact. And there's another thing they need to know is that, is that these votes in Israel, as important as they are to us, are part of a larger expatriate vote. Close to 9 million Americans have the right to vote around the world. And they're angry in this election. They're really angry, Democrats and Republicans, about what Obama and Hillary Clinton did when they passed with the, 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 the law called FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, in 2010, which has turned Americans, probably you too, Natasha, into, into, into pariahs when it comes to doing ordinary banking uh, transactions and, when and you're living abroad. yeah i mean it's become a real burden everything you can't you can't move unless uh, uh, unless you unless you f give up all your rights of privacy under the fact that's why republicans here in israel are fighting it in the courts and we fought it in the knesset and republicans overseas are fighting it in the united states courts too to, to have it un uh, declared unconstitutional and to have it repealed and the only way that's going to happen the repeal of FATCA, because Obama said he's going to veto it, and Hillary Clinton will veto any repeal, is if a Republican sits in the Oval Office. Well, thank you so much for coming in and shedding some light on this recent campaign that you guys have just started, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Well, I hope so. Great to meet you, Natasha. Great to meet you, too. Okay.